Okay, hello, my name is Michael Downey and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the 14th AWRI webinar for this year's program. Now this is a two-part water management session. Part one, we'll take a look at the situation facing growers um, in the Murray-Darling Basin. Part two, we'll discuss trial results looking at the effect of different winter water application rates on yield and quality. Now, before I jump over to today's first speaker, some very quick reminders for the audience. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. Um, please send your questions through at any stage during the session and we'll address them in a dedicated Q&A um, session at the end. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those that have just joined, welcome. The title for today's presentation is Water Management Strategy, an update of the Murray-Darling Basin and combating low winter rainfall. And I'm very pleased to welcome our two presenters for today. First up, you'll hear from Jared Eaton. Jared is the Manager of Water Resource Operations in the Department for Environment and Water and has extensive experience in River Murray operations and management of water allocations. Our second presenter today is Dr. Paul Petrie. Paul has recently taken on a new role at SARDI and leads a viticultural research program aimed at improving the resilience of Australian vineyards. One of his projects is developing strategies to better manage dry winters and to understand and manage vintage compression. I'd also like to introduce Tony Hoare, a senior viticulturist here at the AWRI who will help with facilitating today's session and provide some initial background before also managing the Q&A. So enough from me, I'll hand over now to Tony to get us started. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining the webinar today. Uh, we're bringing you this webinar today in response to uh, what we see as some current issues to do with water management in viticulture around Australia. Um, so hopefully, um, you'll be able to um, find out a bit more about the um, allocation of water in the River Murray-Darling system from Jared today, um, who'll give a, a snapshot of um, the current um, state of the River Murray system, and also um, where allocations are, are likely to be during next growing season. Um, I'd just like to note, there will be a, a, an opportunity to ask questions at the end, so we'll devote 10 minutes after each of the speakers speak for 10 minutes. Um, we'll have 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I'd just um, ask you if you could just um, direct questions on an operational basis to Jared in particular. Um, he won't be answering any political questions um, around water allocations. Um, second speaker is Paul Petri from Saudi. Um, Paul will be talking about um, some trial work, which is um, quite interesting, looking at the influence of um, starting the season with um, soil moisture um, and the effect of different soil moisture levels going into the growing season on yield, vine performance and fruit quality. And um, that's in response to, I guess, um, constantly reducing rainfall in southeastern Australia over the winter period. So hopefully um, um, that's a, a good combination um, to address water issues and I'll hand it over to um, Michael again, who'll introduce Jared as our first speaker. Jared, take it away, thanks. All right, uh, thanks Michael and uh, thanks Tony. Uh, welcome to the audience today and what I'll do is I'll give you a, a fairly brief overview of uh, what is happening across the uh, Murray-Darling Basin system, more so concentrating on uh, the River Murray system, uh, what has happened so far this year and the sort of conditions we're looking at uh, going into uh, the, in the 2019-20 uh, water year, which commences on 1 July. So next slide, please. So in terms of uh, Murray-Darling Basin uh, rainfall, um, 
What this uh, slide is showing you is the rainfall deciles over the period August 2018 until the end of April uh, 2019. So a lot of you would probably be familiar uh, with the products that uh, the Bureau of Meteorology uh, put out, but what this is really showing us is that uh, across uh, large parts of the Murray-Darling Basin, extending into South Australia, uh, there's been below average to very much below uh, average uh, rainfall. Obviously that uh, extended duration of below uh, average rainfall nearly over two years now uh, has had a significant impact on uh, River Murray system water availability and also the volume of water held in the Murray-Darling Basin Authority controlled uh, storages. So some areas that we watch uh, in uh, with very close interest are what's the area across northeastern uh, Victoria, in particular the uh, Hume and Dartmouth uh, catchments. Uh, there's two major storages up there which are really critical uh, for water supplies into the River Murray system and for obviously water allocations to South Australia. Next slide please. So this graph here is outlining the River Murray uh, system inflows uh, between June to May. And now where we've been tracking so far uh, this year in the 2018-19 water year, there's a mo uh, sorry, a sort of pinky coloured line um, just above uh, the yellow uh, flat line down towards the bottom of the graph. So we've had uh, inflows this year at a level you'd expect to be exceeded 95 years out of 100. So very much on uh, the dry end of uh, the scale. Uh, the long-term average uh, inflows are represented there in the dotted um, red line. And we've actually, um, just going back a couple of years ago now, 2016-17, uh, we had widespread uh, flooding upstream of the South Australian border in response to obviously well above uh, average rainfall, and that's represented there uh, in the green line. So what we've seen over the, since that 2016-17 uh, water year is a gradual uh, reduction in terms of the rainfall and the inflows, uh, which are now going to have a significant impact on water resource availability uh, coming into 2019-20, so general drying conditions uh, over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the volume of water currently held in storage, so uh, this is uh, as of a couple of days ago, there was around about 33% uh, held in uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority controlled storages, so that is Lake Victoria, uh, Hume and uh, Dartmouth reservoirs. Same time last year was 52%. Uh, percent, and you can see the long-term average uh, for the end of May is around 62%. So uh, what we're seeing is uh, well below the long-term average storage volume uh, for the end of May. And that is part of the reason why all states have said uh, there'll be low water availability and uh, low water allocations uh, in all states at the commencement of next water year and depending on the different uh, entitlement type uh, which people have access to, uh, in some cases there is no allocation against those different entitlement types at this point in time. Next slide. One other uh, key, I guess, bit of information we look at uh, when we're trying to determine what may happen with the forthcoming season. Again, this is another Bureau of Meteorology uh, product. It is the stream flow uh, forecasts, which are updated on a monthly basis uh, by the Bureau. Now, over on the left-hand uh, side of the slide, it's showing unregulated inflows into Hume Dam. And what this is showing us is uh, we're expecting low inflows on the basis of uh, what the Bureau is saying. There's about a 50 odd percent chance of expecting uh, low inflows for that April to um, June period. Uh, when we look over on the right hand side of uh, the slide, um, this is showing us the uh, potential for inflows into Dartmouth uh, Reservoir. So a bit of a different picture between uh, Hume and Dartmouth. So one showing around a 53% uh, chance of low flow and the other is showing about a 33% chance of low uh, flow. Um, so obviously there are differences uh, depending on uh, what catchment uh, you're looking at. Um, but certainly Hume uh, catchment is one that we all watch with uh, interest because it has quite a large uh, catchment area in comparison to Dartmouth uh, Reservoir. Next slide, please. Also, when we talk about volumes of water held in storage, it's really important to 
uh, look into that number in a bit more detail. So um, the volume of water held within the Murray-Darling Basin Authority controlled storages is already assigned for a range of different uh, purposes. So South Australia, we have a storage right. We have around about 342 uh, gigalitres that is set aside and that's storage for meeting future critical human water needs and private carryover. Uh, we've announced private carryover will be available to eligible entitlement holders uh, for next year. There's also um, minimum reserves which are set aside uh, to help run the River Murray system in 2019-20. So there's 440 uh, gigalitres set aside for that purpose and there is other volumes of water set aside for both uh, state carryover but also including for the environment. So obviously we have a basin plan in place now which has been recovering uh, water entitlements for a range of environmental purposes throughout the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin and the River Murray uh, system. So there is some underuse in terms of that environmental water for use uh, next year. Uh, we are expecting quite reasonable volumes of environmental water uh, to be carried over uh, into next year and that is because there's been a, a range of different deliverability uh, issues being in place this year. Next slide please. Another important graph for people to look at is the uh, Murray-Darling Basin Authority uh, controlled uh, storage graph. So this graph is highlighting uh, the storage uh, volumes from 2000 up until 2019. So the blue line is uh, the long-term average active um, storage volume, it's, which ranges between about uh, 4,800 gigalitres as a, as a low level up to about 6,900 gigalitres as a high level um, over that, long, over that uh, period of time there. And the black line is showing you the active storage during that time. So early 2000s, quite good storage conditions. Uh, 2002, uh, the millennium drought really started to impact on uh, flows into the storages. We had a number of bad years between 2006 until 2011 when the millennium drought broke with quite extensive flooding in the southern connected basin. And then as you can see, uh, we had uh, above average um, storage volumes for a number of years. Come to 2016, another high flow event, but then since that uh, period of time, we've seen the uh, volume of water in storage gradually uh, declining uh, to the current point where it's about 3,100 uh, gigalitres. And there's been a slight improvement over last month, which you may be able to see in the slide there where there's a little sort of kick up in the, in the black line. Next slide, please. Um, we, we often, people often ask us questions about, well, where does water uh, come from and how is water accounted? So as a general rule of thumb, what happens is um, any of the inflows that come into uh, those upstream storages, so Dartmouth and uh, Hume, and also one of the tributaries um, being the Kiwa River, that provides water uh, that is shared equally uh, between New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Anything that comes in from uh, the top of that slide being in New South Wales, any of the flows that come in from the Murrumbidgee River in New South Wales or anything coming in from the Goulburn River in Victoria, uh, that's up to uh, the states to allocate water uh, from their tributaries and South Australia doesn't get a share of any of that water for consumptive uh, purposes. Um, Menindee Lakes up in New South Wales, they're in a pretty dire situation at the moment with around about 1% uh, storage volume there at the moment. So the drought has really been impacting on uh, flows into Menindee for a couple of years. Next slide, please. Uh, the way in which the, um, I guess th this is a simplified uh, version of um, how water is shared. So uh, think of it like a simplified bucket model. So the first um, uh, I guess component of the bucket of uh, water which is allocated is what we call as conveyance water. So that is the water which is required uh, to run the whole of the River Murray system, including down into South Australia and cover off on storage losses. So on average, that's around 1,596 uh, gigalitres. Uh, next bucket to be allocated is critical human water needs. So each state has defined their own critical human water needs volume. Then above that, we have a conveyance reserve, which is set aside for the following year to ensure that under worst case scenario, if there was a shortfall in that conveyance volume, modeling indicates to us that 225 gigalitres is required as a, as a reserve to provide for that 1,596 gigalitres. 
Anything that's left over in the bucket then uh, provides for state water allocations. Over on the right, we have South Australia's storage right, which is managed independently of that total volume of water uh, held in storage. Next slide, please. Uh, so I guess at a, at a high level, in terms of the River Murray water allocation framework we have in South Australia, uh, first priority is to provide for running the River Murray uh, system at 696 gigalitres for dilution and losses that allows for flow into uh, Lake Alexandrina of around 350 uh, gigalitres, 204 gigalitres for uh, crit critical uh, human water needs. Uh, the source of that critical human water needs can change depending on uh, our levels of uh, water availability. Uh, 693 gigalitres is made available for all other purposes. So we say that's our general uh, consumptive pool. Uh, we have water being provided to wetlands out of our dilution and loss, that 696 gigalitres uh, we talked about before. There is uh, environmental water consumptive pool, which is water that has been recovered uh, from wetlands that have regulators put on them. And one of the uh, most recent changes to our water allocation framework is the uh, inclusion of the Adelaide um, desalination plant. So in a dry year, like what we're coming into in 2019-20, uh, there's a trigger which is met under our water allocation framework that uh, allows 50 gigalitres to come from the Adelaide DSAR uh, plant, which is equivalent to an 8% increase for irrigation allocations in SA. Next slide, please. So this is a, a pretty, uh, I guess it's just a, a broad summary about um, how that water allocation framework works. Uh, I've split it into two components, but just uh, focus on what is to the right of uh, the slide. So that is, um, this is showing the volumes which I've um, talked about earlier. We're currently at 22% of allocation. That's a volume equivalent to 990 uh, gigalitres. Um, one of the other changes when we get to 100% allocation, uh, that's at 1,496 uh, gigalitres now. So we've got a, a framework which uh, looks at providing as much water uh, to our water users as quickly as, uh, as possible. And um, that framework there also includes uh, that change for uh, Metropolitan Adelaide. Uh, previously it was 150 gigalitres, but now it's 100 gigalitres with the 50 gigalitres coming from the Adelaide desal plant. Next slide. So in terms of uh, the outlook for South Australian water users uh, for the forthcoming water year, um, yesterday we announced an increase up from, uh, sorry, up to 22% uh, allocation. Um, so that was an increase of 8% uh, allocation up from 14%. Uh, um, but what this is showing us is the likelihood of achieving certain allocation uh, by a point in time. So if we, if we look at uh, the average condition um, line by the end of September, uh, there's a 50% chance of 53% allocation by September, but a 100% chance of, uh, sorry, 50% chance of 100% allocation uh, by the end of January 2020. So obviously there needs to be an improvement uh, in terms of water availability uh, to get to 100%. But if you even take another drier case like that 95% uh, type scenario, there's a 95% chance that uh, by April uh, we'll be on 64%. So we've tried to simplify uh, the information that we uh, have put out there. Next slide, please. Uh, we might actually slip, uh, sorry, um, go over this, uh, skip this slide. Um, people can read it afterwards. Um, in terms of uh, private carryover that's been made available for South Australia, so this is one of the recent changes that we've also uh, brought into place. Um, we've been setting water aside for private carryover uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, private carryover is only available if that uh, projected minimum opening allocation is less than 50%. At the moment we're saying it's going to be at a minimum 22%. So there's still obviously quite reasonable prospects of that uh, private carryover uh, being made uh, available. Um, one important point for people to note is that with private carryover, uh, people can't exceed 100% of their uh, allocation either. So there are a number of, I guess, requirements in relation to 
being able to have access to private carryover. People have to have their final meter readings in uh, by the 31st of July, um, and there is no application for private carryover. If you have your application, if you have your meter readings coming in after that point, um, it's unlikely that uh, water users would be considered for having access to private carryover. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, getting more information, what I've put down here is a couple of websites um, for South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria that have a whole range of uh, information in relation to water availability, water availability projections and the state water allocation uh, framework. So my presentation today has just looked at it from a South Australian perspective, but you can click on those links and find out uh, more information about both uh, New South Wales in Victoria, I've also put my contact details down there. If you have any questions, by all means, uh, uh, send me an email or uh, give me a call. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so I am going to speak today about a One Australia funded project looking at managing winter drought, um, how it affects vine balance and grape and wine composition. This project is a collaboration between SARDI, the South Australian Research and Development Institute and the CSIRO. Okay, so what, why are we doing this? Why are we interested in this as a topic? Um, building on Jared's um, slides from uh, 10 minutes ago, we're seeing a drying trend across Southeast Australia. Um, so this means that there, we're receiving less rainfall in most of our um, grape growing regions and also less rainfall obviously in the, in the tributaries to the Murray-Darling. If we look at the time or the part of the season when the rain or the reduction in rain is occurring. Most of this is recurring down during the, the autumn and the winter as opposed to the, to the spring and the summer. And why is this important? It's important because for a lot of our regions, the um, vines use water that has fallen as rain and fills up the soil profile to grow at least for a, a part or a portion of the season. So if we're somewhere like Barossa or McLaren Vale, those vines grow using the um, water stored in the soil profile through until sometimes December or into January, depending on the, the season and the end season rainfall before you need to start irrigating. So if we're seeing these dry trends, we're going to have more seasons that we start without a full soil profile and we're looking at ways that we can we can manage this um, especially for regions that are lucky enough to have access to um, other water sources so um, recycled water or water ex the, the Murray River. So the aim of the program project is to assess the effects of winter rainfall exclusion and how we replace that winter rainfall um, and then to develop better management guidelines for, for dry winters. Uh, because we couldn't guarantee that every winter was going to be dry during the research period, um, we put these uh, rainfall exclusion shelters in place. Um, uh, we've just come in from last week putting the, the covers back on the exclusion shelters. They are effectively a, um, a, a poly thin sheet that goes over a framework, as you can see in the background of that slide, and they prevent water, um, rainwater reaching those vines during the winter. We then looked at a range of methods to replace that rainwater. So we had five different um, scenarios that we looked at. We had a control along the bottom here where we didn't have a shelter in place. Um, if we had a very dry winter, um, we would put a little bit of water on those vines using a sprinkler system. But generally if it rained, you know, enough natural rainfall during winter, we didn't need to do that. We had two treatments that had what we'd call a, a full winter irrigation. Effectively, that was equivalent water to um, match what would normally fall during the winter time. And we applied that using two different methods. One, we applied it with a sprinkler system. So the water was applied to the entire soil surface underneath the vines. And secondly, to a dripper system with obviously point sources of, of, of water along the dripper pipe. 
we had two other treatments where we replaced the rainfall with a reduced amount of irrigation. Um, one was a, a reduced rain where we effectively just put a little bit of water back into the system to um, repre represent a, a very dry winter. So you know, what would happen if the, we had low winter rainfall? And another one was a, a spring rain treatment where we looked to apply irrigation to refill that soil profile um, around bud burst. We saw this as the sort of management practice that a, a grape grower might use and that they would um, wait until the end of winter and say, oh, crops, my grapes are starting to grow. The soil profile is quite dry. I better put some water on and fill it up and, and get them going for the season. So if we look and see how the vines responded, when we replaced the irrigation, uh, sorry, replaced the rainfall by irrigation with sprinklers or drippers, we were unable to, to fully restore yield up to where the control was. The sprinklers did a little bit better than the drippers. We think this is because the sprinklers applied water to the whole soil surface, whereas the drippers only um, irrigated sort of a sausage shape of water underneath where the, the emitter was on the dripper pipe. The reduced rain um, treatment reduced the, the yield, probably not surprising in that those vines started with a lot less water um, during this and then were dry during the season. So they, um, they, they, they struggled. They often also had smaller canopies um, and, and didn't perform as well. What really surprised us was the, the spring rain treatment. Um, we thought that this would be a little bit more effective than it was um, effectively by um, applying irrigation and filling the, the profile at bud burst, we thought we would, um, you know, the vines would, would respond well to this, but in fact, the yield was reduced by this treatment and the vine size increased. So if we go over here, we, the, the vines effectively grew a lot more, um, a lot more biomass, they grew a lot more roots, they grew a lot more shoots and canopy at the expense of yield. So they switched between having a, um, focusing on, on reproductive development to focusing on um, more growing um, yeah, leaves and, and canopy. Um, the irrigation during bud burst also had a negative effect on um, wine phenolic composition and, and sensory attributes. So effectively that big canopy shaded the fruit and we got a um, reduction in phenolic concentration, um, some of the um, reduction in some of the positive fruit aromas and, and wine characters. Uh, compared to some of the um, other the, the other treatments, especially the, 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 um, the treatment that received the least water during winter where those, those characters were increased. So what are the implications for this? Um, or how, how, how do we recommend that you, you manage your winter irrigation on this basis? Watch and see how the um, rainfall is going through winter. Benchmark yourself against the long-term average. Um, when the winter, when you have dry conditions during winter, if you have water available, we would recommend that you, you apply some of that during winter to maintain a moist soil profile. Don't wait just to the end of winter and then look to fill the profile then because basically by then it would be, it would be too late and you would stimulate that vegetative growth. Um, so yeah, if you want to maintain some more soil moisture during the, during the winter. Um, just to acknowledge my um, collaborators in this project and funding from Wine Australia and the rest of the, the group that I worked with. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Jared. Um, if you have any questions, I encourage you to um, type them now. And um, what I'll do is I'll read the questions out and then um, I will um, direct them to the appropriate speaker. So we have a question to get started with from Rob uh, for Jared. Um, is carryover water something that actually physically exists or is it simply an artifact of accounting? If it doesn't physically exist, on what basis are people allowed to use it? Jared. It's a very good uh, <clears throat> question, Rob. Um, that water physically exists. It's sitting in storage. Um, over the last couple of years, we've set aside, um, at the moment, 102 gigalitres of, I'll use the word, wet water. So it's sitting up in Dartmouth uh, Reservoir. Um, at the moment, there are conditions, obviously, around its usage. Uh, I guess the first one of those conditions is the minister uh, needs to make that carryover water 
are available and uh, the trigger for that is an opening minimum allocation of less than uh, 50%. So um, there's certainly more broader provisions um, than that under our water allocation uh, framework, which I'd encourage people to uh, have a read, but just directly answering the question, it does exist, it's sitting in storage and um, it will be made available next year. Thanks, Jared. At this stage, we don't have any further questions. Um, so if you do have any other questions that you'd like addressed from this webinar, please um, don't hesitate to contact the help desk directly. Um, um, look for my contact details um, and I can direct questions to the speakers later on on your behalf. Um, thank you for your participation in today's webinar um, and uh, it will be loaded onto the AWRI website um, in the not too distant future if you'd like to refer back to it. Also, thank you to both our speakers for their participation. Yeah, I think we can leave it there. Thanks very much, as Tony's mentioned, to both our speakers and also to Tony for joining in and taking part in today's session. Um, as Tony suggested, um, we will be providing all attendees with a link to this recording, so please look out for that. Um, thank you again for participating, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next AWRI webinar.